On this week's episode of Where We Are, we're going to talk about our therapeutic culture. Fun times. You're listening to Where We Are. This is Where We Are. We are the Where's. I'm Michael. I'm Melissa. Melissa. Hiya. What's up? Hey, it's uh, good to be back for another episode of Where We Are. Uh, I had so much fun with the feedback to last week's episode. Particularly, Melissa, I think uh, we've identified a new talent you have, and that is... uh, Choosing the music for the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good feedback on the music. Yeah, people uh, dug that. Um, let's I'm nothing see. if not silly. <laughs> You're a lot of I'm other a silly things, goose. though. So. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Updates. Forgot to mention it. Last week's episode. Washington, D.C., November 6th and 7th. Center for Christianity and Public Life's For the Good of the Public. It's our inaugural summit. We'd love for you to be there. Uh, Go to ccpubliclife.org. There's a whole page for the conference there. You could register for tickets um, and would love to see you there. I I think it's going to be a really amazing time. Uh, And so would love to see at that. And then also this week, uh, the Center for Christianity and Public Life opened up the application for our Public Life Fellowship Program. And so if you are a Christian who is serving the public through your vocation, we'd love to have you apply. And so, again, you could go to ccpubliclife.org and do that. We'd love to receive an application from you. Melissa, anything on your end that you want uh, folks to attend, sign up for? (laughs) I have nothing. Do you want to tell people about this pop-up that you went to today? Oh my gosh, yes. So on Friday, I got a TikTok of a store in Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Mills Outlet. I love that you say you got a TikTok as if it was like... It was delivered to me by the algorithm. (laughs) (laughs) The algorithm knows me, it knows all. Okay. It's my best friend. Anyways. um, (laughs) My best friend algorithm. (laughs) I would would like to introduce you to my best friend algorithm. Continue. So this Philadelphia Mills, which is an outlet mall just north of the city of Philadelphia, um, a store called Reclectic, so Re-Eclectic, and it's the Anthropology Free People Urban Outfitters brand, and I didn't know this at the time until I went today, but it's a pop-up, it's very temporary, this big warehouse of heavily discounted Anthropology Free People and Urban Outfitters items that only opened two days ago, so I took Searsha today. We had to wait 20 minutes in line to even get in the store. We shopped around quickly because, yes, the prices were incredible. Um, And then proceeded to stand in the checkout line with two cashiers for three and a half hours. And it was one of those things where once you get an hour in, you kind of realize, oh, no, I'm an hour in. Oh, how much longer is this going to take? I have a four-year-old with me. You know, we have to tell everybody else in line that we have to go to the bathroom. Like, I don't have any water. I don't have any food. This is uh, all court evidence for some <laughs> some case in the future. Yeah, it's, it's really great we're putting this on uh, for posterity. Um, and it's one of those things where it's kind of like, well, I've already committed one hour to this line, so let's see how long. And then you're two hours, and you're like, well, I've committed two hours to this line. I might as well keep going. I love teaching my daughter perseverance and resilience, especially when it comes, <laughs> especially when it comes to deals. To bargain on time. <laughs> Oh, Honestly, it just reminds me of my childhood because I went shopping with my mom all the time for bargains. And when we couldn't afford it, it was always put on layaway. So, I mean, just teaching my daughter the art of a bargain. But I got 18 items for very little money. Some very pretty things that I love from anthropology because I, I do love anthropology. But I never shop there because I think it's way too expensive. I mean, since our education is proceeding... Um, <laughs> On this front, I wasn't planning on introducing this until she was at least seven or eight, but I think she might be ready for the art of the deal. Yeah. I I think she might be 
uh, ready. The is only, the audio the book read by? I Trump? was just gonna say, should we do the audio book <laughs> or just give her the the text give and her see the what tone. she does does with it? But I think the audio book's the way to go. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, great deals. But it only this it's a pop up, so it only let, it only like lasts a, week, a very right? short time. Okay. So if you're anywhere near Philadelphia, totally go. Because there's some great home goods stuff there, but let alone clothing. But be ready for the slowest checkout line you've ever been in your entire life. Yeah. Yeah. That was our adventure today. Saoirse and I, she, we got home at 10.30 p.m., two and a half hours after her bedtime. So She was thrilled. She was thrilled. She was perfect and wonderful throughout the entire five hours we were inside that warehouse store. She entertained every single person around us. She made two new best friends, a 16-year-old and a 21-year-old. Just... Honestly, it felt more Barbie than the Barbie movies with the camaraderie happening between the women in that store. I had the same thought as you were t- talking to me about this whole scene. I was yeah, like, so if you like loved Barbie, Barbie and the feeling Barbie gave you when you went and attended it in the theater, think of that on steroids. You can totally go to the Reclectic store at Philadelphia Mills in Which, Philadelphia. Right, just like 95% women and Oh, all... it was 100% women. <laughs> And just all of them getting like 80% off. Yeah, sometimes 90%. I got <laughs> I got a dress from the Farm Rio brand, which is extremely expensive, for 90% off. I mean, I, I should do a whole podcast episode with just like a haul, a haul of what I got. <laughs> this, this podcast has become a pasta podcast and now has become a... a uh, yeah, we're really branching anthropology out. anthropology haul We're podcast. really branching out. That's what happens when... Uh, when you've been doing uh, the show for so long. Yep. I mean, we have had, what, Melissa, 300,000 downloads? Yes. Yeah, 300,000 downloads. We've done, uh, this is, what, our 74th episodes? Our 76. Wow. 76 trombones at the counterpoint. <laughs> Sorry, okay. They were followed by rows and rows of the finest virtuoso. Okay. Um... <laughs> That was my eighth grade. My seventh grade. Musical. Which is when we met. Wow. We met on the, at, on the theater stage for Music Man yeah. Jr. Thank, thank you, Harold Hill. All right, all right. We're going to get into the substance of this episode right after a quick break. You're listening to Where We Are. Hey friends, Melissa here. It's about that time. We want to recommend another fantastic podcast on the That Sounds Fun Network, and it's Unexpected with Hannah Love. Have you ever spent much time thinking about the events that led you to where you are? Have you ever noticed that some of the most unexpected moments are the very ones that God used in the biggest ways? Not only did Hannah Love notice this theme in her own life, but she also saw it all over the Bible. From Moses and Gideon to David and Esther and Nehemiah, God seemed to call the most unqualified people to do the most unexpected things. As you listen to stories from the Bible and from her friends, she hopes you gain a new perspective of how God loves us enough to call us to the things we couldn't have imagined for ourselves. This is unexpected. I can personally recommend three episodes. That's the very first episode, Purpose and Hannah's Story. Episode 8, Millennial Influence, Finding Purpose and Facing Anxiety with Shay Lee Mills. And Episode 4, Chosen Called Beloved, Seeing God's Hand in the Unexpected with Stacey Machuk. Unexpected takes the form of devotional style episodes focused on a topic and a story from the Bible. So with episodes releasing every Monday, I think it's a great podcast to pair it with Where We Are is Morning 5. Tune in to Unexpected with Hannah Love. Happy listening. We really only have one topic, uh, although three articles that will kind of help us get into it. I want to talk about uh, our therapeutic culture, um, a bit of how it's affecting our politics, but I think the best way to get into it is this story that ran in the New York Times last weekend about Jewish day camps. And first I'd say, you know, like, uh, they gave this Times reporter pretty incredible access. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, And so, you know, you, you could think about that what you will. I mean, I, I felt 
I mean, it it describes life in these camps and all the various issues these kids are dealing with. So, yeah, so let so me back up. So this is outside of New York City and the 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 reporting centers around Heather Klein, who uh, oversees uh, NJY camps, which are a network of Jewish overnight camps in Pennsylvania, but a lot of, a lot of New Yorkers send their kids there. Um, uh, and these, the, the story is about the uh, uh, mental health issues at these camps, but also like interestingly, the way that parents, counselors, and, and the kids themselves I know the term social contagion has gotten sort of controversial, but it's it's very hard not to think it as you're, there's just this environment where there's like a snowball effect. And so, for instance, you know, at one point, uh, the kids are described as therapized. They use all kinds of uh, medical, psychological terms to refer to other kids to process their own experiences. Uh, it's also the counselors. So there's a story in here about um, a, a counselor who, um, uh, a, a kid that was, so actually I'll read the quote. Uh, a kid that is just crying and has lost their breath because of crying, the counselor is like, she's having a panic attack. Miss Klein said, no, this is part of the problem, she added. They're all so therapized. And I took that to mean that she was referring both to the counselors and, uh, and the kids and the parents, too. And that's the other piece of this. The parents are uh, constantly calling. The parents are scanning the photos that the camp posts of their kids. And by the way, right, like what would you say, 10, definitely 20 years ago, you sent your kid off to these camps. You had no idea had no what idea. they were doing. So the fact that they're alive. The fact that there are these photos at all is says quite a bit. Then you add on to that, that these that parents are analyzing these photos for signs that their children are unhappy or uh, are not uh, or, or that anything in their experience may not be uh, ideal and they will reach out to the to the camp so there are stories here about parents pulling their kids uh, uh, from from camp uh, uh, and a, a lack of resilience is a significant theme so Melissa I just found this to be a really powerful insight I have a ton of thoughts on it. The, the main thing is I wanted to flag this so that others will read it. Like, like this really is just a story you have to read. The headline is Summer Camp, Sun, Swimming, Archery, and Therapy. Uh, and so, Melissa, I, a couple things I, I sort of put on the table. One, right, like everything, everyone involved here means well yeah and we'll kind of get to this with at least one of the other stories we're talking to which is like everybody means well the fact that everyone means well uh doesn't mean that their behavior and even their perspective their outlook should be unquestioned like you could mean well and yet be bought into a perspective that actually, that that does that is not helpful that does cause harm and so i did read this thinking about some of the debates around public schools and also just some of the tensions like you feel as a parent uh about um whether like what what can be like, well, you know, everyone's kids are, are 
sort of uh, going going through this. It's everyone's. Uh, it's not just. It's not just my kid that's in this class or my kid that's uh, sort of being given. Uh, that's watching this show, and there's like a there's like a temptation to be like, uh, like what 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 makes what makes uh, like me so special that I would have something to say when everyone else's kids are doing it. But this story, like, very clearly shows this this. Uh, this this way in which the parents the counselors and kids are sort of ratcheting up these um anxieties health claims there was a part of the story that you pointed out melissa something like 20 percent of the kids at, at at these camps were taking meds for uh adhd, ADHD and then 15 percent for anxiety, anxiety and depression, and depression. And at breakfast every morning, somebody announces breakfast meds and a whole, all those kids, you know, line up to, you know, to take their medication um, for whatever it is that they need it for. And I pointed out to Michael that for the kids who aren't taking medication, that it is becoming a, that it instills a norm to see everybody around you and not, and by I say everybody as an over-exaggeration, but... To but see it does many, see, it many, does many see, of your yeah, peers you have a friend walking group, up yeah. and taking, you know, these meds in front of you when you yourself don't take meds, that there is a norm being created there, a sort of, you know, social tether that is super interesting to me. Um, that for the kids who are unmedicated for whatever reason, either because they don't have they don't have one of those issues or, you know, they remain unmedicated, like it's a it's a thing to watch a ton of your friends suddenly go up and take their meds. Not and I don't say that as like a um, a negative thing. I say that as a like something that is social. Well, yeah, but it it is a negative thing to the extent that it's leading kids to be put on drugs that otherwise would not be. But there's such a an an expectation that. Well, well, nothing's wrong with you, you know. Like, like if if one out of every three kids is going up at breakfast time to get meds, that does the the the, the, the what it must um, lead kids to sort of question about their own sort of lives, well being, what they need. That like that's that's uh, that that can be uh, uh, that that can dictate or guide guide behavior so uh, i think that's one thing i thought about the other thing that i thought was weird about the story uh and this isn't like um i'm not saying this as a oh i wish they were really critical of the religious aspect of these camps uh in uh, but it is weird that they're jewish day camps and religion never comes up in the whole story. Like, like if there were, other than to say that they're Jewish camps, but I kind of positively wondered, is there anything from the shared religious background, the fact that they are, like, what does it mean for it to be a Jewish day camp? Are there any religious aspects of the camp? And are those religious aspects providing any sort of uh, uh, salve to these kids' needs? I, I'll also say, like, I find it really, um, it like, it's a particular kind of camp. And so, like, it's, 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 uh, the fact that there's not even a paragraph s sort of exploring how generalizable this is. And if not, like, <laughs> what's, like, like, uh, the story is reported as if this is happening with an entire generation. I think that's probably true, but the fact that they were at a specific camp in a particular geography, pulling from a particular socioeconomic status, it seemed like to me, and pulling from a particular religious background, it was just weird to not have, for how identity-driven so much of journalism is these days, to not have any of those aspects sort of unpacked uh, struck me as as 
as weird, like I'm, and not in a just in like a missing missing piece kind of way. Like the the full story wasn't wasn't reported. So I I I, I wish that we knew more about the role of uh, religion in in these camps. Um, but yeah, Melissa, anything else you want to say about this story, and then. This episode will kind of build, so hopefully folks will like keep the story in mind as we talk about other pieces. But and anything else you wanna you wanna add? Yeah, I just think that there's, and this will come up. I think with the other couple of articles, it's always in the back of my mind, especially when we're talking about a therapeutic culture. Is that in a therapeutic culture, you know, you've got a lot of therapy language running around and oftentimes I feel so inadequate to be talking about a lot of this stuff because like I ultimately don't know that much in terms of like what actually goes into an ADHD diagnosis or what goes into you know um, saying that this child is autistic or you know uh, what does depression anxiety actually look like in a child versus looking like an adult and like how do you deal with these things it even goes down to, because we've actually gotten questions before from the audience about um, Michael and I, our thoughts on gentle parenting um, and authoritative parenting, which are two very similar um, dynamics of parenting. And I have found that even down to, and especially because, you know, in this particular article about the Jewish day camps, um, it's very helicopter parenty <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um that even down to day-to-day parenting, everything is therapized. Like you look at any like Instagram account, Twitter account, TikTok account where, you know, it's, you know, some self-proclaimed or somebody, you know, with a bunch of degrees, their expertise on, you know, this is how you gentle parent. And, you know, for all these various, you know, psychology-based reasonings and you should do this, otherwise your kid's going to get ruined or whatever. Um, You're asking people almost like I'll use the term lay people to use very complex systems of thinking of approaches of frameworks that are oftentimes based in a lot of peer reviewed studies and sometimes not and actually sifting through as to who is the expert and who is not is like really difficult in the first place. And then what is it actually based off of like decades of research or like one study that, you know, didn't have like a, uh, more than 30 participants so it's not statistically relevant like you know uh, this 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 article on the sort of like day to day like what we're dealing with in terms of the fact that anxiety depression all sorts of things are just skyrocketing in generation alpha as we've already seen with gen, with gen z and with parenting sort of being therapized in so many ways and pretty much the majority of us not having any kind of training in this stuff, any kind of real background as to like how to discern through these things. It just feels like a lot of pressure and it feels very confusing. And I, you know, for me, I read through these things and I'm kind of, I don't know what to parse out what is actually like a real trend and like what is contagion. Like, again, like you bring up the contagion thing, which I, again, I agree. It is like a controversial, um, a framework at this point in time but like you can see it um, yes <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, so i i want to put that out there is like where i'm sort of sitting when i'm you know going into these next couple of articles which i think like also bring up some really excellent points about like socially societally where we're sort of sitting at this point yeah so keeping all that in mind let's move to uh to this uh, this Atlantic essay from Jill Filipovic. Filipovic. Unclear. Uh, but we've talked about some of her writing previously on the show. She she was a very, in the, uh, in the last decade, she was a sort of well-known on the blogosphere she, she, as, a, as a feminist blogger. Um, she, uh, she's now, uh, you know, an author written books and, and is, uh, is, it has a bigger platform. Yeah. She has Uh, a large social media following. Uh, she wrote, uh, for the Atlantic 
the, the, the title of the article is, I was wrong about trigger warnings. And in the article, she sort of unpacks the reasons why she would invoke trigger warnings and promoted the use of trigger warnings uh, uh, as, quote, uh, that it seemed like an easy accommodation easy accommodation to make for the sake of our community's well-being. We thought we were making the world just a little bit better. It didn't occur to me until much later that we might have been part of the problem. Uh, she talks about how the warnings multiplied, how the idea of a trigger warning became uh, became a, a, a cultural phenomenon. Slate declared it the the uh, declared 2013 the year of the trigger warning. Um, but but she then tracks the decline of mental health particularly among young uh, young girls and young women. Um, I'll read from, from the essay. Since my days as a feminist blogger, mental health among teenagers has plummeted. From 2007 to 2019, the suicide rate for children ages 10 to 14 tripled. For girls in that age group, it nearly quadrupled. The 2021 CDC report found that 57% of female high school students reported persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, up from 36% in 2011. That's like stunning. Like 2021 CDC report found 57% of female high school students reporting persistent feelings or sad of sadness or hopelessness which is up 21 points from just 10 years earlier. Uh, though the pandemic undoubtedly contributed to a crash in adolescent mental health, the downturn began well before a COVID hit. Uh, she goes on to, uh, to relay that we know that teenage girls are reporting high rates of sexual violence and bullying. Uh, uh, Today's teenagers are less likely to drink or use illicit drugs. Um, uh, so, so, so this is in the context of uh, teenagers being less likely to drink or use illicit drugs, the percentage of children living in poverty falling, and yet these mental health issues are exploding. Uh, and, and she, obviously, she doesn't, she's not saying trigger warnings are to blame for all of this. But she uses that as a sort of window into, again, the, a sort of therapeutic culture that grab, ha, has grabbed hold, again, for good intentions. Uh, I really think how she framed it is right, this sort of like, well, it cost me nothing all, really nothing to, put a, really to yeah. put a trigger warning, and people are asking and sometimes de demanding it and saying that without it, uh, they're being harmed. And so like, what's the, uh, I, I thought like, what harm uh, could I could I be causing? So I, I, I found this really, I found this really helpful. She, she wrote it, she really focuses on, on sexual violence in particular, which for, for a lot of the writing she was doing, that's what a lot of the trigger warnings were about. Basically, she says that trigger warnings have, as again, talking about trigger warnings is a gateway to talking about this larger conversations, but trigger warnings have gone from warning people who've been through specific traumas, like, hey, you're about to read about this. So if you're not in a place at this point in time to read about it, don't read it. But if you are, go ahead kind of thing to, hey, everything is uncomfortable. I'm putting a trigger warning for everything so that you don't ever experience discomfort. Right. Um, those are two very distinct things. And I just really appreciated this article from Jill because like, she's very careful in the way she writes about it, not to say that like trauma isn't real or anything like that, or that trigger warnings haven't been helpful to people because, hey, I've put trigger warning for some of the stuff that we've put together in Substack yeah, sure, because sure. I know that there are folks reading it who you know, I care about um, having a warning. I myself have appreciated them. Um, 
and have, you know, maybe because I'm not having a great day, have stopped reading something because like, I know that it's going to make me feel even worse. Uh, and other days, like I'll be able to read it. Like I know my, like she, she is just very careful to say that like, it, so there's a paragraph in here that I think encompasses just how careful she was about this. That I also think is like, um, uh, sort of puts this, you know, this idea of the trigger warning into like a broader picture that pairs really well with that um, New York Times piece we just yeah, read yeah. on the Jewish camps. She says, applying the language of trauma to an event changes the way we process it. That may be a good thing, allowing a person to face a moment that truly cleaved their life into a before and an after and to seek help and begin healing. Or it may amplify feelings of helplessness and hopelessness elevating those feelings above a sense of competence and control. We have the saying in the mental health world, perception is reality. Um, one of her experts that she interviewed said, so if someone is adamant that they felt something that was traumatizing, that is their reality. And there's probably going to be mental health consequences from that. So Jill is like trying to get into the subject matter of if we tell young people, especially who have growing and developing brains, who haven't had tons of experience um, with all kinds of things in this life and you might be experiencing different things for the first time that if everything is a trauma and everything is unsafe they will begin to believe that like that is how the human brain works in a lot of ways and so she in this article is sort of apologizing participating and sort of bringing the culture in that direction in that resilience helping to create um, young human beings who are resilient versus basically telling young human beings that, you know, you are, you are your trauma. Like those are two very different ways of right, like right, right. talking to young people and helping them to actually process through the bad things that they are going to experience in life. Um, uh, she doesn't like necessarily say that, but for me, like that's where I take it to of, life is really difficult and hard you will go through some sometimes some really horrific and awful things and they can be varied in different ways and you can experience them in different ways and process them in different ways and there there are you know ways to get help out there to process them but like there also should be there as well um training and how to be resilient and the current therapeutic culture is more about like life is happening at you more than that you're and walking to you and to you more than you're walking alongside your life and as the horrific things happen or you're reminded of your past horrific things that there are ways of being able to cope with that yeah versus just to sit in it constantly and stew yeah yeah i'll just read a bit more from the article uh, most of the experts I spoke with were careful to distinguish between an individual student asking a professor for a mm -hmm. specific accommodation to help them manage a past trauma and a cultural inclination to avoid challenging or upsetting situations entirely. Thriving requires working through discomfort and hardship, but creating the conditions where that kind of resilience is possible is as much a collective responsibility as an individual one. If we want to replace our culture of trauma with a culture of resilience, we'll have to relearn how to support one another. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I thought it was a thought it was a helpful story. Um, the 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 last thing I'll say on this, and and again, this will be relevant as we move to the last story we're going to discuss is. And and I guess I've kind of. Uh, referred to this with talking about good intentions but it's it, it's significant I think to point out like how in a particular online culture being willing to use trigger warnings was an indication that you were like a good person yeah um, and so so you know I, I, I just Right, the obvious question to ask is like, wh what are what are what are we doing now? What are the hallmarks of our sort of online culture and just social behavior broadly uh, that you, you know that um, people are willing to go along with now because it doesn't cost me anything. Like, what's uh, but but you know this. She's not talking about that long ago. Like this revision is 
of something that she, uh, you know, she was doing five, ten years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so I just think that's uh, another interesting, interesting thing to to, to think about. Like the, the, the revisions that we're having are not even generational, no, Melissa. No, they're very. It's like they're very. It's short like while I. Ago. It's like I thought this was the most important thing I could be doing like three years ago, and now I see that it really wasn't that meaningful or it was harmful. And it seems like there are more and more of these kinds of things. Yeah, and, we, and the time frame is getting shorter and shorter. You and I, <laughs> and one of the re- yeah, you and I really resonate on this particular point, especially in reflective articles like this, which we're seeing more often from a lot of different leaders, um, is that this happens all the time in politics. You and I are, you and I are constantly, you know, just, a, you know, between us saying like, Oh, that person wrote that on Twitter or wrote that article. Uh, I'm pretty sure their stance on that was com- was like yeah. a 180 about 18 months ago kind of thing. Um, and I think it's the ability to be online and to have so much information available to you and a platform um, available to you to constantly be sort of uh, pushing whatever sort of ideas that you have that you're resting on. People tend to hold a lot of this type of stuff, and like it's completely understandable why why you would, um, very tightly, and very staunchly, and argue your point. And when you're when it's available, when you have an online platform available to you, and you're able to repeat these things over and over again, then when you go and change your mind, or you see the negative consequences of the position you thought was once so good to have, that's when it becomes more of like if if things have been feeling more and more like a whiplash or like a uh, while we constantly seem to be reimagining exactly like socially how we should conduct ourselves and you know what our society should actually be built on and look like, it's because of this constant availability due to you know the digital presence of you know all of our opinions and our thoughts and our policies and political stances, ideologies, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, th- I think that's right, Melissa. L- let's. I just wanted to close because uh, David Brooks uh, wrote for the Times just a few days ago, uh, bringing into contact something we've talked about on this show. I mean, we've talked about therapeutic culture before. Yes. And uh, we've talked specifically about Christopher Lash. We have. We've been reading often together uh, through Lash's books. Um, and, uh, I've been promoting that folks get, gain familiarity with Lash for... And it's not because his views are perfect. It's no, because, um, he... But he is tapping into, he is tapping into something, Mark, uh, that, that seem that seems to, um, be salient in this moment. M- Mark Lilla, the, um, uh, the, the academic wrote an article about the uh, the the right in France and uh, he profiled a sort of an emerging center right that was not hyper nationalistic like Le Pen but also wasn't the left uh, like young people are are often sort of assumed to be but a sort of often Catholic uh, center right uh, uh, movement and he noted in that article that they were all reading Lash and mm-hmm. this was maybe a 2014, 2015 article. It wasn't like an article from the last three years. Yeah. And that's uh, th- that's when I started uh, picking up some of Lash's work. He wrote a book in 1979 called The Culture of Narcissism um, that is... Uh, is significantly about uh, a therapeutic culture that was uh, that was developing. David, uh, so, so so David talks quite a bit about this. Uh, he opens up at if I were asked to trace the decline of the American psyche, I suppose I would go to a set of cultural changes 
that started directly after World War II and built over the next few decades when writers as diverse as Philip Reif, Christopher Lash, and Tom Wolfe noticed the emergence of what came to be known as the therapeutic culture. Uh, he continues a bit later on, as Lash wrote in his 1979 book, The Culture of Narcissism, uh, uh, such people uh, are plagued by an insecurity that can be, quote, overcome only by seeing his grandiose self reflected in the attentions of others. Plagued by anxiety, depression, vague discontents, a sense of inner emptiness, the psychological man of the 20th century seeks neither individual self-aggrandizement nor spiritual transcendence, but peace of mind under conditions that increasingly militate against it. Uh, Brooks goes on to recap uh, some of the information, I mean, in some cases, some of the very information that is uh, covered in, in Jill's article, including that Slate Magazine proclaim, proclaimed 2013 the year of the trigger warning uh, and some of the mental health data that we saw. Uh, interestingly, uh, Brooks brings up the book, The Body Keeps the Score, which uh, I think he's right, became a defining cultural artifact of, you know, the 2010s. Uh, I, I was hearing about it, not just in, like, in churches that was coming up all the time, in, in, in sort of religious contexts, that this was... Uh, the body keeps the squirrel was a, a, a salient concept. And then David goes on to talk about how this is sort of uh, encroaching on and affecting our politics. So w what happens when you have folks that, w when you have a culture that, um, where life is happening to you, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, then taking that, to our politics and expecting our politics uh, to, to react and account for that. He writes, the instability of the self has created an immature public culture, impulsive, dramatic, erratic, and cruel in institution after institution, from churches to schools to nonprofits, the least mature voices dominate and hurl accusations while the most mature lie low trying to get through the day. The people with these loudest voices often operate in that histrionic manner that suggests that they are trying to work out personal wounds through political expression. People on all sides genuinely come to believe they are powerless, unwilling to assume any responsibility for their plight, another classic symptom of immaturity. And so he goes on to call for uh, a sort of... Uh, you know, a return of maturity in our uh, in our culture and our politics. Um, but yeah, Molis, I thought this was a good. I, I I do think there's a strong tie between therapeutic culture and, as I've put it, people going to politics to try and get emotional and spiritual needs met. Like I think there's a direct line to be drawn, but. Uh, what, what did you think of David's piece or, and just the, the conversation generally? Yeah, I, I mean, it's basically, I mean, you and I had talked like what, around eight or nine months ago, and I had said to you, I get this sense or feeling that the pendulum is starting to swing back on the therapeutic culture. I said this out loud to you and just to you. Yeah. I was just starting to see some things. And then with like the spate of like pretty mainstream writing on this, just in this, this last week, this single week. Um, uh, first of all, I'll couch everything in that. I hope this pendulum doesn't swing back so far that we've complete, that we take everything bad out of like a non-therapeutic culture and then, you know, make that our sort of idol. But uh, so I'll just put that out there, set that aside. Um, you know, uh, Brooks's art, uh, Brooks's um, op-ed also gets to a part of like what Jill Filip Filipovich in The Atlantic gets at, which is like this focus on the self, the focus on the individual, which obviously Lash in the culture of narcissism focuses on a ton that the 1970s was marked by this sudden turn towards considering the self, the self being um, 
you know, above all, like the most important thing to be focusing on. And, you know, Jill and hers is kind of like collectively we're, we're not, we're going to be able to address our mental health crisis and, you know, the crisis around everything being therapized, like both things happening at once. Like we're only going to get to that if we actually like work together, like it's not going to happen on an individual level. And, you know, Brooks's article, uh, goes dives into that as well as sort of like this problem with only focusing on self-growth self-development that sort of thing and the only, the only thing that i want to point out um that you quoted you know david writing here around you know it was right after the end of world war ii and then you know like into the 70s where like this sort of therapeutic culture in this he calls it the nascent form um sort of came about and I also just want to point out that World War II, um, you know, the United States didn't get involved right away, but got involved, you know, in the in the 40s. And uh, a lot of men fought in that war and a lot of them came back completely and utterly traumatized and then had pretty much no, they, you know, yeah, there were supports for them, but supports for anything but actually processing the fact that they had just gone through a horrific war. Then we had the Korean War, and then we had the Vietnam War. Um, and the Vietnam War came with a whole, like, an entire just just a ton of baggage politically. That it's not surprising that this that the '70s and the '80s looked like what it did, and now we have a sort of repeating of that. When yes. World War Two caused, like, it's funny. I don't know if this is irony. Ca- funny enough, like, caused a lot of drama that went completely unaddressed, unaccounted for, and then you know we got this this sort of this focus. Um, I want to point that out yeah. as a special feature of of our history. Yeah, that's super interesting. So, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. But interested in what uh, what listeners think i would recommend uh obviously that you look at all the articles we mentioned uh would recommend that you read lashes the culture of narcissism uh which is uh they they released i think it was a 20 or 30 year edition of uh of of the book yeah that i think ej dion wrote the uh, wrote a new forward for, um, uh, but would would uh, recommend you check that out. But that's all we have for this week's episode of Where We Are. We will be taking a break next week. I will be speaking in St. Petersburg, Florida on uh, next Sunday, uh, August 20th at 6 p.m. at City Church in St. P- Petersburg, Florida. So if you're in... The St. Petersburg, Tampa, Orlando region would love to see you out for this, uh, for this, uh, for this, this great event. I'm really looking forward to it. All right, that's really all we have now. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Where We Are. We are the Wares. Bye. Bye. <laughs>